Hey, peace and love, ladies and gentlemen. Here, welcome to another episode of Greatness of Scholarship, showing the great works of what academia has produced. Today, I got the great Dr. Kara Cooney, Egyptologist. Great person. You're talking about person who is qualified. She's a professor currently of Egyptology at UCLA and chair of the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures. She specializes in social history, gender studies, and economies in the ancient world. She received her PhD in Egyptology from John Hopkins University. Her popular books include The Woman Who Would Be King, Hatshepsut's Rise to Power in Ancient Egypt, When Women Ruled the World, Six Queens of Egypt, and The God Kings. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, I present to you none other than Dr. Kara Cooney. How are you doing today, sis? I'm good. Thank you so much, Brother Garfield. It's lovely to be on the show. All right. And up next, of course, the person who brought me into the community who recognized me as someone who do a lot of research and himself, and he's been doing this for over 15 years, presenting to everybody. You already know the great, the, he calls himself the God killer, but he's known as Unquest in the community. How are you doing today, brother? I'm doing good, man. How you doing? How you doing, Kyra? How you feeling? How both y'all feeling? I'm great, man. I'm in the company of greatness. <laughs> so, hey, before we um we we move on, I want to say, um, Dr. Kara Cooney, you're well admired in this community. Everybody likes you. There's no one that does not say, hey, I don't like Dr. Kara. Everybody likes you, but they might <laughs> like you for the wrong. There were some for the right reason, and in my opinion, some for the wrong reason. But at the end of the day, they all like you. Well, we'll awesome. get into it. We'll get into it and see if they if they like me for yeah, the right yeah, or wrong. Yeah, reasons. this month yeah. this month I have a few scholars coming in. I got Dr. Manfred Betak. I got Dr. Jonathan Shores. I got Dr. Richard Carrier. I got a, I got a whole Dr. Bruce Haynes. I got a bunch of different scholars. I even have a Greek specialist breaking down the words melancholy, black, and all that stuff in ancient Greek, trying yeah. to give us a better understanding in the community. So, so interesting. February, yeah. So for February, we we doing a, we doing a lot. And one of the controversies about um, that's going on in the community for the past three years, people, I've lost many friends <laughs> over this no. conversation. And no. my brother here is beefing with some of his best friends. The whole thing about who were the ancient Egyptians? Were they black? Should we call them black? Like are we call black today? As a matter of fact, you know what? Let me take a step back. I'm going to allow my brother on to ask his question because he specializes in this area better than I do. But my brother, how would you ask her this question that's going on in the community right now? Well, well, well first of all, I specialize in deferring to the experts. That's really my specialty. <laughs> Let's get that straight. Yeah, I'm just a guy that picked up some books and, and, and started to understand academia. But for me, uh, once I realized after the human genome was mapped out, I think, 2003, and I started to uh, recognize the uh, social constructs, how race is a social construct, uh, I started looking at things a little bit differently. And uh, skin color is not a good indicator of ethnicity. I learned that too. And so when, when I looked at the Nile Valley and my conversation was, was they actually African? It never was, was they black? So now when I see like the, uh, the Boston Museum and the Brooklyn Museum, I finally see it. They say, well, they're indigenous Africans. So what do you say that is, is, a better, is it better to classify them as indigenous Africans Right. We know they, you know, you got Nubia, uh, Levant, all those areas. Right. And or is it better to call them black? I, I personally feel like my argument is that they are indigenous Africans ranging in skin color has nothing to do with being mixed because homo sapiens sapien is the mix. So for you, we, we, in this conversation, you you the tiebreaker. I want you to know that the pressure is on. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that to Dr. Kushi. Yeah, I gotta put it, I gotta put it on sheet. Yeah, I gotta do it. So what is it? What is better when we're dealing with academia? What term is better? So this is African or black. I, I'm gonna go with African, first of all, but but okay. I, there's some things to set up. And just so if if your listeners want to do some extra research. Um, I have a colleague, um, African-American colleague, Shamarka Keita, who's written in a volume that I edited called Ancient Egyptian Society. And it's a paperback mm -hmm. with Rutledge. It's not too expensive, but you can get it at your library, too. I okay. think it's like, you know, 30 something dollars. It's not the end of the world. But he's got an article in here and it is called um, Ancient Egyptian Origins and Identity. And he breaks down the 
he's a medical doctor and a PhD in Egyptology. So that's a bit of a unicorn, right? Um, mm. He lives in Washington, D.C. And he breaks down the idea of what is race, what is ethnicity, what is skin color, what words should we use, and, and how should this actually work? And and I've learned a lot from him about how we should be talking about these things or can talk about these things and what kinds of things are possible to discuss in the ancient world. But let me start out with something that I think is super important. And one reason that when this is discussed in social media, native Egyptians lose their minds and get really <laughs> upset. Have you noticed this? That yes. You, yeah. So, so number one, the word black in Arabic and everyone in North Africa in, in is speaking Arabic, right? Because of uh, um, elite replacement and, and the Arab conquest, if you want to call it that, of the 7th and 8th centuries. Um, they might be speaking French. That's another occupation and another conquest. Um, but, but North Africa is a place where Arabic is spoken alongside Chadic and Berber and things like that. In Arabic, the word black has not been radically reclaimed by people. It is a negative word. It is a word with stereotypes of servility and slavery attached to it that is a problematic word. Nobody wants to be called black like they do here. So here we're now capitalizing the word black and we're talking about black culture in a very positive way. This is not something that you're going to see in North Africa. You might see it in, in Central and Southern Africa, but you're not going to see it in North Africa and Arabic, right? Okay. So the way the word is perceived in Arabic is in a hyper negative way as if you're putting somebody down you're it's it's very problematic that's problematic in and of itself but <laughs> start with that right okay. now then attach that to the the united states understanding of blackness in which people were brought against their will in large numbers to act as unpaid labor to found the country of the united states of america with their bodies yes and and that way of separating populations and saying these people are enslaved and these people own them or these people are the population was separated in such a way that we created things very um, cruel social systems in the United States like the one drop rule with which huh. both of you and everybody listening is very familiar that you just need Absolutely. one small part of being black and then you're all black all black Correct. right Correct. now yep. you go and talk to an African person particularly a North African person and you say oh are these people black and they'll be like, well, first, we don't like that word. And please don't use that word. This whole black thing, we don't, it's it's a very problematic word, post-colonial in particular. And mm -hmm. second, they'll be like, what you guys are calling black is not what we call black. Um, and because if anyone is mixed race, which I think is a, is a term we might apply to many um, black Americans, uh, people of African descent in the United States, or I, I know um, Jamaica is, is also a homeland um, and, and there you might have mixed race people. Um, and, and then an, a North African would actually understand that better, but would not apply the word black to it. So mm. there's so many misfires and miscommunications between a black American community uh, and a North African community such mm. that, and I'll add to this, the, the, the very problematics of what patriarchy does when it tries to claim a culture. When patriarchy goes in and tries to claim a culture, they say, oh, Egypt is all black or Egypt is all this or that. And those patriarchal claims, those more old school 1970s, 1980s Afrocentric claims do mm. not go over well in Egypt because then Egyptians, and you'll, you can go onto social media and see people lose their minds, <laughs> are like right. they're stealing our culture. How dare they steal our culture? This is a theft mm. of culture. And mm. so if one coming from the African-American perspective could, could understand the charged word black in Arabic, that would be helpful. And if they could understand that imposing a post-colonial one drop rule that is created in America is a mm -hmm. very American chattel slavery created thing, then I think there would be better communication between both sides. Because my answer, if I'm gonna go back in time and get in a, in a time machine and answer your question for, for you, which is were the ancient Egyptians black? I would say, with the definition of black, and we use the word um, African, I mean, all ancient Egyptians are African, <laughs> but Egypt right. is a confusing place because mm -hmm. it is on the crossroads of three worlds, the African world, the Mediterranean world, 
and the Levantine West Asian world. And mm -hmm. Egypt is there for people to cross the Sinai and go from West Asia to North Africa. Egypt is there on the Mediterranean for people to connect from Greece and, and the Italian peninsula and beyond into Egypt. And Egypt is there in Africa to connect with the rest of that massive biggest continent that we have on planet earth yes. and so yes. there's a lot of mixing so when people get into egypt are they african well they're african now because they're there uh, but it means mm. that throughout the thousands of years that egypt has been considered a state or before you had a state in egypt you already had a tremendous amount of mixing between peoples of different ethnic backgrounds, different genetic codes, just a lot of mixing. It's why Egyptian people are so beautiful, because heterogeneity is, is shown to make a more symmetrical face. Um, but it's, it's just a lot of mixture. And then one could ask the question, did the ancient Egyptian phenotype of skin color, which seems to be something people are very interested in, mm -hmm. change through time? And the answer would, of course, be yes, because mm -hmm. Egypt is occupied so many times after the Bronze Age by different types of people, starting with the Bronze Age collapse, and you get all these sea peoples coming in from, from uh, across the Mediterranean, Northern Mediterranean, Greek mainland, places like that, you're going to make Egyptian lighter, in at least in the North, um, but probably in the South too. And, and then you're gonna get an invasion from, or an occupation from Ptolemaic peoples, um, in the the third and fourth centuries, that is going to make BC you, you make Egyptian lighter in a sense, and then you're going to get the Arab invasion, and you're going to you have that occupation from West Asia. You're just going to bring in another admixture. You're not like changing the population, but mm. but you are creating a different um, dynamic mixture within the population. And how you track that? I mean, good luck with genetic tests. But I'll, that was a lot. That was a lot. So I'll throw it back to you guys, and you can you can pick made, it up. Uh, yeah. you made is very important about the population remaining. So yeah. in mm -hmm. your professional opinion, you feel population really hasn't turned over, but it has mixed. It has mixed. And there was a study that National Geographic did in the 2000s. And you can't find it online anymore. They removed it. This is so hot that National Geographic is like, take that study down. <laughs> so you can find wow. articles. I know. You can find articles about the study, but you can't find the study. But the articles about the study say that they collected genetic information from living Egyptians in Egypt and compared it to what they have of ancient genetic information and said, and this is a very rough number, that 70% of the people living in Egypt currently have very strong if genetic connections to ancient Egyptian genomes. 30% addition and change, how you quantify that? Is it within each person? Is it different populations? I'm sure it's a, a mixture of both. But, you know, it, it means that every population changes. Nothing will stay pure. My, my husband is half Ainu, indigenous Japanese. There aren't any pure Ainu left. If he grew up in Hawaii. There aren't any pure indigenous Hawaiians left. What does it mean to, to find a purity and who's asking for it? Um, mm. And then things start to get really tricky really fast. And that's where the patriarchal claims come in. And, and for the whole the conversation, whenever I'm talking about this, patriarchy has done all of us, men and women and children, so much damage. And I like to transcend the patriarchal claims as much as possible. Then you can have a conversation that's really interesting. And it's not like, those are our people. Um, those aren't your people. It's more, we're people. <laughs> and we all get mixed up. And um, it's a complicated world out there. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it's funny that if you look at the whole world as a place, as humans, every culture have the same problem. You're going to have divorce. <laughs> You're going to have... People fighting, you're going to find, you know, all type of different things in, in the same culture. But when it comes to this issue of the Egyptians and um, being, quote unquote, black, and you talk about the patriarchal, um, as far as speaking from that perspective, can you elaborate on that a little bit? And then after this, um, I'll, I'll allow Uncle to ask you some more questions. Yeah, the patriarchal aspect, you know, I, I wrote a whole book about this um, called The Good Kings, which is trying to understand that patriarchy is actually quite young. It's something that we've only lived with this in the in this world for, 
you know, in California, where I live now, 500 years at most, um, in ancient Egypt for 5,000 years at most, um, patriarchy is ruled by the fathers. It's ruled by a minority of men. It's something that is ho about hoarded wealth, hoarded power, control, um, battles, uh, just, you know, patriarchy is, is how you get, um, sexual abuse in the Catholic church and the boy scouts. Patriarchy is not good for boys and men either. Um, mm -hmm. it's a way of creating an unequal society par excellence. Patriarchy is also about using history, archeology, span the past as a way of claiming the present. And in this moment, in this world where we all feel like we're perched on the edge of a cliff and we're going to fall into God knows what, I feel we're going through an anti-patriarchal revolution. But everyone knows that the most bombs are fired before the armistice is signed. And so right now, those holders of patriarchal power, those billionaires, those people that hold the oil fields, those people that hold the religious patriarchies, they are fighting with everything they have to keep their patriarchal power. And so patriarchy is right now having a resurgence. It's why women don't have control over their bodies in half of the states mm. in the United States. It's, mm. it's trying to control women and children. It's trying to control other men. It's also trying to control history. It's creating a founding fathers in the United States mythology that never existed, but is perfected and idealized. And I think that patriarchy in African-American black communities can also be misused such that you can look at African history and say, well, we did Egypt. Now, don't misunderstand me. I am not saying that the ancient Egyptians were not black as we Americans perceive it. They were. The way we define black with mixed race, one drop rule, the way we define black as a positive thing, the Egyptians were black. Not maybe all of them according to our definition, but certainly most of them. And if you go to modern day Egypt today and you go to a place like Luxor down in the <laughs> south, you'll be like, these people are black in our definition, our American definition of what black is, Jamaican definition of what black is. Yes, they are. But when you then uh, use these patriarchal concepts of all or nothing, you know, they're all ours, not yours, then you get into these fights about who owns land, who owns culture, who owns the past. And those fights can be very bitter and very problematic. And we don't need to be having them because we're all everything. My own genetic test showed that I, I have 5% Coptic Egyptian from my mother's Italian Greek side, which is kind of cool and crazy. Do I go out there and claim that I'm Egyptian? No, but it means that I'm a mutt like everybody or like a lot of people. And, um, and that's, and that's pretty damn cool. So, so less claims and more curiosity and more connection instead of the claim, this is mine and not yours. It, the, it's more like, oh my God, look at how we're all connected in this world. And that's the anti-patriarchal movement that I'd like to be a part of. All right, go ahead. Oh, okay. Here we go. I can tell some, I can tell some problems right now. So yeah. you said a few things that most people can't even put together in their mind. So I would like to say this. When you say to me that based off of American standards, I automatically say, well, that's colonizing standards. That yeah. was the standard set by colonizers yeah. and the racist white supremacists. They yeah. were very supremacist in their approach to racialize indigenous people and put their own tags on them. Mm -hmm. So that's the American standard. That am I wrong? Am I wrong in that? I want to be. You sure are. You are not straight. wrong. Okay. So the museums, the curators say they're indigenous Africans to get away from that because we know we study Charles Darwin, right? And, and he and he basically said that humans come from Africa first. He's one of the first people to report that, right? And he's basically saying that you know skin color can actually range. So so we we recognize this, and like you said, the patriarchy. I like the way you say that. The patriarchy, right? I like that. And so, but when you make the point to say by American standards they black, I'm cool with that. But then you say something that's real crucial, and they're not gonna a, a Garfield, they're not gonna be able to put this together. I I know the study you're talking about that said the Egyptians was actually 70%, you know, tied to the indigenous uh population, right? They're not gonna be able to put them two together because their eyes visually have them thinking that what they're looking at yeah. shouldn't be black or shouldn't be African. In yeah. reality. Right. It, it's called uh, an evolution 
right? It can trick your eyes. So you, you, we call it lookership. You shouldn't just look at a person and think you know who they are because you actually can't. Yeah. Like you said, skin change, right? So that's going to be an issue. Garfield know what I'm saying. One minute you said that Americans stand they black. The next minute you said, that's basically the same population because you understand populations are very fluid. They're not mm -hmm. less they statues. Not like you take freeze a human being from 3000 BC and bring them forward. That's the only way it wouldn't change. Population so are fluid. So let me also, since since you're talking about white supremacy in the United States and how that has formed and shaped our understandings of race and ethnicity and yes. power. Yes. This doesn't mean that Africa hasn't received that same generational trauma of Absolutely. white supremacy. They have, Absolutely. but in different ways. And a post-colonial Africa has been effed up just in different ways. <laughs> and so the understanding of how race should work in an mm. Egypt where power is very much assigned to color yep. and not always um but but often is then you get people who having been occupied since the bronze age collapse by one empire after another mm -hmm. um and has only been under native rule since 1950 right um i'm once a dot uh before that before that yeah. so you know yeah. 1950 was their was their revolution um, Sadat is, is going to be after that. But native okay. rule for like, you know, 80 years is not or 70 years is not is not going to create the the confidence in uh, identity. And let me add to this that if you talk to Egyptians today, there is an understanding that they're indigenous African having been occupied by West Asians such that even their language was erased. Okay. Egyptian language was erased by Arab occupation of elites who came in, 10% of the population is replaced, come in and take control of goods, services, labor, commodities, all kinds of things, and they control it. So much so that if Egyptians wanted to have a place in medieval Egyptian society as a, as a player, they had to speak Arabic and drop Egyptian. And that wow. happened so fast. And so think of that wound on a society mm -hmm. that knows their African, that they, they belong to this this great people that that built the first monumental stone structures on the planet that that created colossal obelisks and statuary that that they were a part of all of this and yet they're occupied by a people that tell them one no you can't speak your indigenous african language anymore and two your your indigenous african creations are all of the devil they're not of the allah that we have brought here they're not of the correct god and their the religion was replaced as well Mm -hmm. Christianity had done a number on them before, right? So there's that other occupation in, in, in a way. But you're dealing with an Egyptian population that is also traumatized. And and so what I see is the white chick from Texas coming in who loves Egypt and is like studying this in no man's land with my 5% Coptic, right? Is Coptic. <laughs> Coptic. Hey, you legit, though. You legit. Coptic. <laughs> you got that stuff. We ain't got it. We ain't got it. <laughs> well, it's true. It's true. That's true. You don't because the West African and all of this, but Jamaican is off in East Africa. But whatever, you can tell us your genetic code if you want later. But what I see is two peoples coming together with extraordinary trauma on both sides. And if they could meet in a non-patriarchal way, they would mm. be able to have this discussion and find connection rather than not. But we're talking about an Egypt right now that is ruled by an authoritarian regime. That mm -hmm. authoritarian regime is very West Asian and white facing. Where is its money coming from? Follow the money. And mm. and if you travel to Egypt today, you're going to see billboards with white, happy Egyptian people as white as you can possibly imagine in their villas, at their coffees, you know, doing all their things. And this is the Egypt that is coming in direct conflict with a resurgent black American um population that's like no we have to talk about this in a different way so it's it's a hot mess <laughs> and, <laughs> yes it is you need, and go on to social media and i've i don't think i've ever seen a conversation that creates more anger and fear and shaming and outright racist memes like this one what race were the ancient egyptians nothing makes people hotter on mm. both sides than this mm. one. nothing yeah trust me we yeah, have yeah. lost friends and, and continue to lose friends. And continue to lose friends.
Mm-hmm. And it's all about, uh, uh, it's just crazy. I don't even want to go there, but it's just crazy. I mean, patriarchy is the water in which we swim. That's why, why I wrote this book. And I actually use those words, that patriarchy is the water in which we swim. I'm going to get that. We're going to get that. And it's very hard for us to see what what the world could be like in a sustainable, non-growth, don't kill your neighbor to make more money, compete, compete, compete kind of way. This is the way we've been programmed. We're brainwashed. And we need to find a different way to talk about these things. But it's very hard when people are trying to manufacture power within the patriarchal system. This is what this is mm. what we do. Mm. So here's a good point, a question I want to ask you. So I understand it to be an anachronism when you say that the ancient Egyptians called themselves black. Now, I, I know being an Egyptologist, I know you're familiar with uh, the meta nature and the hieroglyphics. Yes. And so I want to ask you straightforward. Uh, do the Egyptians call themselves black people? And is uh, Kemet doesn't mean a land of the black people based off what you know, your expertise. Two yeah. things, two points. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I'm going to lead you back to this book again, which is really cool. <laughs> okay. Because in here, there's an article by my colleague, Danny Candelora, Danielle Candelora, okay. which is about okay. that word, Kemet, where okay. it comes from, what it should apply to, how it should be used. And I'm trying to see if I can find... Okay. Um, right. Oh, here, there's this one. The Egyptianization of Egypt and Egyptology exploring identity in ancient Egypt. Okay. And she looks at the word Kemet and she's like, what is, what is this word? What does it come from? How are we to understand it? And it's, it's a really wonderful piece. So I'll, I'll lead you there first. Now, okay. did the Egyptians call themselves black? I mean, yes. And not, not in terms of skin color, not in terms oh. of identity. Okay. Um, okay. Don't worry, I'm a teacher at UCLA. I'm used to phones going off. It's kind of mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, it's man. normal. <laughs> You're all good. Um, all right. And so they did not call themselves black via, you know, <clears throat> in terms of their bodies. There are yeah. some Egyptians um, or or Nubians who worked in Egypt who would depict themselves with darker skin as was their right. skin on their books of the dead. One mm-hmm. really wonderful example is a man named Mai Herpri. M-A-I-K-H-E-R-P-R-I. His name Mm -hmm. means the lion is upon the battlefield. It's a wonderful Mm -hmm. Nubian style name. And this Mm -hmm. Nubian man coming from modern day Sudan or Southern Mm -hmm. Egypt Mm -hmm. um, was a bodyguard probably of King, female King Hatshepsut. And his book of the dead has been discovered along with his burial and his mummy, mm. which shows mm. him as a, with a phenotype of a more mm. Central African or Sudanese African look, mm. darker skin, curlier hair, all of those those features. And he mm. depicted those features on his Book of the Dead, which mm. is amazing. Most Egyptian men depicted themselves with a brown or dark red ochre sort of mm. skin color. So they're not calling themselves black. They're not mm. showing themselves black, but right. black and the Kemet is an incredibly important part of Egyptian culture because the Egyptian Nile Valley, when it flooded its banks and it left mm. all of that rich alluvial silt, what it mm. left behind was a thick black earth. Mm. And somebody coming from Europe or West Asia where they did rain fed agriculture is like, what the hell is this awesomeness? Really? This oh. miracle. You just get all of this thick black earth and you throw some seeds in it and that's it. And then they grow and you get more wheat than we could possibly imagine. What the hell is this? And <laughs> it was a miracle for people to see right. that. Bla- and that blackness became a god. And that god was Osiris. And he was the mm. one in which you planted the seeds. So Absolutely. blackness is divinity. Blackness mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. richness and fecundity and new mm-hmm. agricultural wealth. Blackness is getting drunk from the beer and the barley that you grow and you ferment. Um, Mm. The blackness is associated with two divinities I'll name here. One, Osiris, Mm -hmm. who also has green skin because the green grows from the black, right? Absolutely. So he's like like the green shoot that comes from the black earth. And then there's a a goddess. She's actually like a divinized queen. And her name Mm. is Ahmos Nefertari. Mm-hmm. Ahmose, A H M O S E, and then Nefertari. Mm-hmm. I think your audience mm-hmm. can spell pretty easily. Um, right. And she's always depicted with a deep black, carbon black skin. And people ask, is that because she was she was from Luxor? She was from Egypt South. 
maybe it's 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 possible but it also means that she as a divine figure was associated with fecundity new life um this mm -hmm. black earth of egypt so so the egyptians called their land where the nile valley flooded mm -hmm. black but they didn't call themselves black and then one more thing right. when okay. when hold people on, hold on, hold on. that's important oh, Let's yeah, which man. Part? Which part? Oh, well, you said that you just said. the land black, not themselves. Say that again, please, for the people in the oh, back. Okay, so the Egyptians did. called their land black. They called it Kemet, mm. but they didn't. Mm -hmm. call, they did not call themselves black, and there is a okay. reason. Mm. And the reason is, it's only part of Egypt. One mm. reason I don't use the term Kemetology, for instance. Okay. Because it's a okay. reasonable thing. You're like, but it's Kemet, so I don't get it. Mm -hmm. If you're doing mm -hmm. Kemetology, you're only studying the people who live along the Nile Valley. You're not studying right. the you're not studying the peoples in the desert. You're not studying yeah. the people in Nubia. You're not studying the people who who are mm. part of different worlds and going in and out. And the desert is not like just this Saharan space of nothing. The desert is a place full of life and herding possibilities and mining and quarrying and people's moving in and out. And that's Deshret. That's the red land. Mm. So if I'm mm -hmm. saying, oh, I'm in, you know, I understand that Egypt as a word <laughs> is a totally ridiculous post-colonial <laughs> concept. I get it. <laughs> but... Because Egypt is such a complicated place and because the people in the Nile Valley were like, yes, we're the land of the Kemet, but then would go out and try to take over the land of the Deshret, mm -hmm. of the Red, and and would claim both. How, who am I mm -hmm. to say that it's only Kemetology? I can't. And who am I to say that Egypt is only Kemet? It's not. It's much more. And, mm -hmm. and I don't mm -hmm. want to do disservice to the Pangrave people, to the Medjai people, to, yeah. to people that are mm -hmm. part of... Egyptian discourse, but didn't live on the black land. So it's, mm, it's a much mm. richer conversation. And then strangely, though, this is going to piss some people off using <laughs> the term Egypt, which is a weird um, word that comes from. Hoot yeah. From the Coptic, mm -hmm. from the uh -huh. Memphite temple, Hoot Ka Ta. And mm -hmm. then you get a Egypt in there. And mm -hmm. it's like a Greek understanding of a place that's just applied to the whole country. And it's stupid. I agree that it's stupid, but there's no better word that's going to combine the whole thing for us that's useful. So uh. so why not use a construct? Because, uh. because the other words are so localized that they can uh. only be used for particular places and cannot be used for the whole. That's You, you know what? You talked about, uh, I, I, I love your explanation. Just one with that one. But you mentioned something. You mentioned pan graves. I try to teach people that you find pan graves all over Egypt, yep. right near the Red Sea, um, mm -hmm. and 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 so the pan graves are important. And also, uh, you, you you talked about. Um, I say people are now centric, like they only study the temples near the Nile. I said yep. you got the Eastern Desert, the Western Desert, everything you say. So I am glad that I have been reading enough that when I, when I hear an expert, that I'm not too far off. I appreciate yeah. that. Yep, I'm and done with a, my question. You know, it's a funny thing uh -huh. that when people are coming from a black centric perspective, an Afrocentric uh -huh. perspective, and they're like, uh -huh. "Where are my people?" Your right. people may not be on all of them in the Kemet that you're speaking right. of. Correct. So many of them are in the Deshret, and so then when you say Kemetology, black <laughs> land, it's a conflation of our understanding of black uh -huh. and the Egyptian understanding of black which yep. were different understandings. They yep. don't have the same meaning. And mm -hmm. you're forgetting your people <laughs> by using Kemet as a catch-all for everyone. Uh, and let wow. me then also add to that a patriarchal reminder, which is that the state in Kemet could have a higher population, more agricultural surplus. They went out into the Deshret and mm -hmm. into Nubia and they wrought havoc. So mm -hmm. By associating Egypt with just the Kemet, then you're being an apologist for the state that actually mm. occupied Nubia and desert areas in horrific fashion. Mm. It's it's better in my mind to use the construct word Egypt, imprecise mm. and ridiculous though it is, because it's what we've got. Mm. So so what was the Pangraves? I know you can find them all over Egypt. I would like you to explain what the Pangrave culture is, the shallow graves, but go ahead. Yeah, and um, Pangrave culture is mm. being that history is being written now because right. archaeologists are finally in the last 20, 30 years taking this 
seriously and really going out and trying to understand who the Pangrave people were. The Pangrave people, they, they, I, as I understand it, exist from Middle Bronze into Late Bronze and beyond. Mm -hmm. And they can be buried sometimes in Pangrave style, very close to the Nile. Mm. And and also very far away, as you say, Red mm. Sea. And then they also extend north and south in a in a very broad geographic swath. Mm. East desert, west desert, north, south, into Sudan, into mm. Egypt. And mm. they're a moving people. They're not a people settled in one place. They're on mm. the go. Mm. They might be associated with mercenary groups like like the Medjai, people who mm. would sell their military skills to, mm. to other people. They mm. might not be only that. And... Mm. And so the Pangrave people, it's like a cultural way of burial. It's the only mm -hmm. way we can really talk about them. But then who were they? Were they the Medjai? Were they mm -hmm. more than the Medjai? Mm -hmm. Probably. And and that work is being is being done as best we can do it. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's not easy work because so much of identity is assigned through text by people assigning it to themselves. I am of Kemet or I am of this town in Egypt. Uh -huh. um, you don't, the Pangrave didn't, the Pangrave people for the most part, well, they don't leave an, a little note in their grave saying, we are this, we are that. Correct. But they're using the Pangrave style to say that they belong to a certain culture that is different from the culture of Kemet. Absolutely. And, and that's, that's the key, I think. So they're interacting with the people of Kemet. They're probably intermarrying with the people of Kemet along the Nile Valley, but they're not of the Kemet so, space. So so those pan, those pan graves, you can find a lot of them down in Nubia, the Nubian area. Yeah, absolutely. Am I correct? Am I you correct are correct. That? Yeah, okay. you are correct. So so I, I, I and, and I appreciate your explanation of that because now people don't just think I'm a nut. Because they was no. thinking I was a nut. So I no. really appreciate that. So now you have a you really have a rich intermixing of people now mm -hmm. when you talk about mm -hmm. that. Yeah, yeah. I thank you. I, I appreciate your expertise and, and and the way you answered those questions eloquently. Yeah, and the, the Pangrave people connected Egypt and Sudan. They connected Facts. those two spaces. Mm -hmm. They connected the Nile beyond the cataracts. Mm -hmm. So if you can't take a boat mm -hmm. through those those cataracts of, mm -hmm. of granite boulders that are blocking the way, the Pangrave people could get around them, no problem. And no they issue. transcend what they transcend Kemet and they make mm -hmm. the discussion of blackness in Northeast Africa that much richer, that much bigger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we need to be less myopic about how we identify people and places and and disassociate it from power and claims and when we do that then it's wonderful yeah yeah because they didn't seem to have this issue they didn't i don't think they attribute specialization to skin color and i know from absolutely uh, not right? and, the, and, and i think that's our mistake we do yeah and the medjai people they want to be free and on the move and and fl move, flitting in and out of different societies they're not there saying we're going to take over this or that this is a patriarchal way of thinking. It's a Kemet state way of thinking. So mm -hmm. we have to pull ourselves out of that and think more Pangrave, and then we'll be able to make more connections. Because I'm certain the Pangrave people didn't think in these terms of mm. ethnic identity claims. So let me ask you this. Uh, when when, when African-Americans, when we don't do the broader study like you're actually talking about, yeah, it's kind of deep because we, we came under the yoke of imperialism. So yeah. could, could we safely say that Egypt itself is an imperialist state? Or am I mischaracterized? Okay, so the word empire is a tricky one, and I'm going to correct okay. it Okay. in just a little, in a small way. You're, mm -hmm. My simple answer to your question is yes, Egypt okay. was an imperialist state, Okay. depending on your understanding of the word imperial. Imper an empire for me is a place mm -hmm. like the Roman Empire, the Persian Empire, that demands growth and okay. that encourages a multicultural society of many languages, okay. many religions, okay. I don't think Egypt was imperial. Okay. I think Egypt was hegemonic and always went into the Levant up to the Orontes uh, and took control and smashed and grabbed and took a bunch of stuff and put up temples. I think Egypt mm -hmm. always went down to the second cataract and a little beyond mm -hmm. in Nubia mm -hmm. and smashed and grabbed and took control of people and were much crueler, arguably, in the south than they were in the north. Mm -hmm. But they, they weren't imperial. An empire would be like the 25th dynasty king's from Kush, like Taharka, uh, Pianki before him, those were imperialists. They're oh, coming. Man. Those <laughs> are imperialists. Oh, no. Oh, man. Pianki. Oh, oh man. you just killed That's the whole Taharka. thing. 
Not the Taharka. <laughs> Taharka. And that's that's why I oh, wrote the last man. chapter. The last chapter wow. of this is all about Taharka. Because yeah, he's funny. the first. It's kind of a cool claim to fame. He's the first yeah. African imperialist. He's wow. the first, in my opinion. In my in your opinion. opinion. I got a yeah, we're gonna get a copy of that book. I know you showed it on some of your um on your channel, and everybody should definitely like and subscribe to your channel. You still you still going live on that channel? I and don't I do um I do podcasting. Um right. I don't do as much live because it it's um the good kings I've got with. some right wing dog piling, so I don't do as much live just for my oh, own safety and peace sanity. of mind. Yeah. I know you you know how yeah. tough it can be out yeah. there. So I curate and control That's things. So you. now I'm on okay. my podcast Afterlives of Ancient Egypt and I write right. a Substack called Ancient okay. Now. So I keep it more in there and I I don't do as many Facebook lives but for the same reason. But yeah, it's um, terrible. But it's we'll horrible. we'll see what I can do. But but so I, I'm not saying that Egypt didn't occupy they didn't you. settle. They did these things. They occupied. They settled. They mm -hmm. hegemonically conquered. Uh -huh. But I'm not going to say that they were imperial because that wasn't their system. Okay. They're just I, going I like into that. the same places and taking the same shit and then moving out again yeah. when their mm -hmm. state gets weak. Mm -hmm. Imperialism demands a certain kind of structure that's not mm -hmm. direct rule that allows vassals to rule and it allows mm -hmm. different uh, multicultural society and the Kushite kings mm -hmm. are perfect for them for this. So they'll mm -hmm. be like, we'll keep our Kushite stuff. We'll be part Egyptian, part Kushite. We'll have our language. You have your language and they're able to imperially conquer. If it mm -hmm. weren't for running into Esser Haddon in Assyria, mm -hmm. the, the imperial state of the Kushites would have lasted much longer than a hundred mm -hmm. years. Yeah, and it did in back. the South and it did in mm -hmm. the South, right? Then they just right. moved their imperialism South. So yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but I got through I got through the pandemic listening to your podcast. Oh my Just god, that's your so live great. Podcast. Absolutely. Listen to I your love lives. it. Mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah. yeah. All right, go ahead, Garfield. I got all mines off. I'm good. I have no more questions. <laughs> Appreciate this one, boy. It's a good one. I mm -hmm. actually was live streaming on the YouTube for a little bit. And they uh -huh. got the good part. They got the good part. They got the good part. They, they the got way the good put, part. Yeah, I always say that 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 novice like me and you, right? Mm -hmm. We always make more mistakes than the experts do. So, like I said, I'm an expert at getting people to the experts. That's that's really my claim to fame is introducing the experts. A lot of times the experts don't want to do like you. Like, I already know you're a down to earth, earth person. I already know. it. Cool. Real cool. So I appreciate you coming into this community and doing what you're doing. Because a lot of experts, they like you said, they get attacked. Right. Okay. Like, that's why you do your lives. No more. I know it. So yeah. I appreciate what you're doing. Absolutely. Oh, let's, thank you so much. Let's rewind a little bit. You talk about um, Egypt being imperialistic. I always tell people that I don't see Egypt, not to be all crazy about Egypt and in love with Egypt, but I don't see them as a type like an Assyrian or a Persian or a Greek or a Roman, a Roman um, imperialistic way, how they go and take over cultures and live there and move yeah. there and try to control the area. I never saw Egypt as that. No. And let me put it this way. Mm -hmm. Empire also demands new people. Egypt doesn't need new people. Egypt has all the people it, it, ha it needs on the inside. Empire needs to get resources outside of its core. Egypt doesn't really need to do that. Yeah, it can smash and grab in Nubia, it can smash and grab in the Levant, get some trees up north, get some stone and gold down south. But they have most of what they need within their borders. So they're, they're able to be self-sustaining as a hegemonic state. It's still a patriarchal thing. It's not always pretty. It's very cruel to most of the people um, and very unequal, but it's not imperial. Now, when you're thinking of imperialism, think of the Iron Age. Think of when the Bronze Age collapses around 1150 BCE, 1000 BCE, and, and Egypt got its ass kicked. One empire after another. You start with... Um, Except I would say you start with the first empire would be the Kushite occupation. And then after that, you get an Assyrian occupation and they even sack and burn Thebes and Memphis. And after that, you're going to get a Persian occupation. And after that, you're going to get a Ptolemaic Macedonian occupation. And after that, you're going to get an Arab occupation. And after that, what do you get? I guess a European occupation in many different forms. And now you could even argue that you have a West Asian UAE Saudi occupation economically and that egypt has never been unoccupied since the iron age and that's in my opinion a sad truth but it's a way of looking at this 
at this place. Yeah. Um, very interesting question coming. Have, do you see within all those occupations, do you see like a, any mass immigration or mass migration of local Egyptians or native Egyptians leaving Egypt? Have you seen that in the records? Yes, so many peoples. I mean, more recently, this is very recently, people are still leaving Egypt. So you could say after World War II, there was a very sizable Jewish population. And those people, when Egypt nationalized in, in 1950, those people left and went to different places. They, they went to Europe, they went to Israel, they came to the United States. Um, so you have that, that Sephardic Jewish population having left. Now you have a mass of Coptic Christians leaving Egypt, coming to places like Southern California in, in massive numbers. If you can get out, you will. And what used to be a population of 20% Coptic Christians in Egypt compared to um, Muslims is now almost approaching single digits. I haven't looked at the numbers lately, but it's um, it's it's not great for for Christians um, in Egypt now. So you have you have people moving out. Now, in ancient times, do you, did you have these kinds of mass migrations? Uh, it's it's harder to see. I mean, you could you can track people coming in and out of Levantine spaces, uh, meaning that the Exodus story that we read in the Bible has more kernels of actual truth to it than than most scholars would like to admit. Um, that there are big movements of people in and out of spaces who might share a certain identity. I can I can see that. And then it's mythologized into a simple story of floods and Pharaoh's army being defeated. But there are big movements of of peoples um, in and out of this of this place. Yeah. All right. Um, when you say big movements, do you see it during the the Bronze Age, the Iron Age? Because I'm I'm speaking of how. People would say, hey, you know, I saw we have a population of probably 3 million and we have a population probably moving towards 3.5 to 4 million later in the, the end of the Iron Age, going up, moving forward to the Greco-Roman age. Um, do you see mass migration of hundreds of thousands of people? Because that's what yeah. being, being portrayed of hundreds of thousands of people. Hundreds moving. of thousands of people being going from where to where? From, <laughs> from Egypt to wherever. From Egypt to wherever. Okay, no. The, in, actual, in actuality, it's the opposite. So if you're going to look at the Bronze Age collapse of 1000 BCE, mm -hmm. and you're going to say, you know, where are people going? Mm -hmm. You have mass migrations, probably starting in 1200 BCE, of peoples who are leaving famine-infested, drought-infested lands of Southern Europe. Mm -hmm. who are then moving around the Mediterranean basin, settling, toppling dynasties and settling in places like Anatolia, um, the Eastern Mediterranean seaboard, and in Egypt. So you actually get the sea peoples who have these tribal names like Peliset, which is associated with Palestine. So many Peliset moved to the Levantine coast that the name Palestine comes from that. You have mm -hmm. um, the Sheridan, so many people of the Sheridan tribe moved from, from European lands to Sardinia that Sheridan became, Sardinia became named after these people. And, and you have other tribal names of, of the sea peoples moving all around and settling in Egypt. So you have people from European and West Asian lands coming into Egypt because it's a place that is not as affected by drought and famine as rain-fed agricultural places in the rest of the Mediterranean, rather than leaving Egypt. It's actually the opposite, I would argue, for the Bronze Age. Um, you made a statement, and I have to say, I have to um, ask you about what you said. You said the, um, the Exodus, the kernel of the story. I do, I do believe it's 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 the storyline is full of mythology, and some people would call it historical fiction. But mm -hmm. to say that Exodus never happened would be you'd be lying to yourself. People moved in and out of Egypt. But it might not have the numbers, as the biblical text says, but of course, it's, it's, it's obvious. It's obvious. Yeah, that I mean, hundreds of thousands of people were coming into Egypt in the Bronze Age collapse. The Exodus story is a little bit earlier than this, arguably. Mm -hmm. So if it's Ramesid, then we would say it's like 1300, 1250 BCE. And you have 
you could have hundreds of thousands of people moving from Levant to Egypt back and forth. You can also have people identifying themselves by their ambivalent and difficult relation to Egypt and this state. To me, the best thing that the Exodus story relays is the fall of Egypt's self-governance. It's over after this. So when Pharaoh's army is destroyed, it's a way for people to mythologically understand how Egypt has been so diminished from the Bronze Age Egypt to the Iron Age Egypt. And that's what the Exodus story is is telling me. Okay. You know, this is a, um, a weird, I don't know if this is a weird question to ask an academic person, but do you think the downfall of Egypt has to do with their, lack of a better term, their open border policy? Meaning that anybody could come in there, anybody could corrupt the whole system, anyone could move in, anyone could live. Did they, did they need a quote unquote a Donald Trump to put up a wall or anything? Because I don't know. Did that? Do you think that influenced the overall downfall? Absolutely Egypt? not. Absolutely not. I mean, no, nobody has a closed border except maybe North Korea. <laughs> I mean, no one. Look at the United States. <laughs> we have so many people coming in and out of the United States. If we don't create a border policy, people will find a way. And they do find a way. And they come in every day. And we need them to come in because mm -hmm. we actually need the labor. And the people who don't want to yeah. make a policy are quite happy to use this modern uh, exploitation that borders on slavery for people who are going to work yep. for shit wages because they are not legally here. So it, it makes perfect sense in the system that we've created. Borders are never closed. And this is a this is something that this book, um, the ancient Egyptian history book, um, the society book that I keep plugging this one. It's an academic book, but it's really fun. It makes very clear that we can't talk about Egypt without talking about the Levant. You can't talk about Egypt without talking about the rest of Africa. You can't talk about Egypt without talking about the Mediterranean. It is part of all of these worlds. It's like no man is an island, right? Everyone's connected to everyone else, and borders are never the hard walls that you think they are. The people who want to make them the hard walls and to say, oh, your downfall is because we've been made impure by all of these foreigners coming into our land, those are patriarchs who are trying to create mythologies of power that find their origin in a purity of the past. And the past was never freaking pure, ever. Mm -hmm. The past is always a convoluted mess of different peoples going in and out of, of, of impurity. Humans are anything but pure, and they're certainly not monogamous, and they create all kinds of new humans on the daily. So this is, this is is um, these are fictions that help to define nation states and their rulers. It's not there helping us understand how people actually interact and move across borders and that borders are not lines. They're these fuzzy boundaries between where people stop and start, what languages they speak, how they might identify with one ethnicity or cultural stream or another. Um, it's as complicated as you could possibly get. And just one, one little thing to give you an idea of this. I study the Bronze Age collapse mm -hmm. and I'm publishing a book um, in like it'll come out, I think, in June called Recycling for Death. And it's all about how men of Libyan origin from the west of Egypt are coming into Egypt and claiming the high priesthood, claiming the kingship of, of southern Egypt and northern Egypt, and are using kings like Tutmos III as like their totem king. So even though you've got foreign kings in the 21st dynasty who are Libyan and often have Libyan names, they're still trying to get into this space, keep their Libyanness, while at the same time saying, oh, but I, I'm like Tutmos the third, the god king of the 18th dynasty as was. They don't use the term 18th dynasty, but they're trying to have their cake and eat it too. Like, like JFK was a president who was Catholic and had a certain background, but also tried to get all in line with the Puritan founding fathers mythology, right? So, and and Obama is, you know, a, a black man trying to negotiate being a black man while also being one of, you know, he had to be more perfect than perfect because yeah. he knew what, what would be said about him versus somebody like Donald Trump or Bill Clinton or whatever. Um, but negotiating a different ethnic cultural past and putting it into something that is mythologized and where there are expectations, the same thing happened in Egypt um, in, in a very interesting way. I don't know if that 
answer to your question, but there's, yeah, there's more people going to Egypt in the Bronze Age and Iron Age than are leaving All right. for certain. All right. Well all right, so we're back and 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 um, getting back to getting to a different topic totally now about Christianity, the connection to um to Egypt and so forth. Before we get too deep into it, um, a lot of folks um feel like there's a direct connection. This is where the the, the, the conversation kind of like get me crazy. I, I I understand influence, understand cultural diffusion, understand all of that, but folks think like. These Christians were like looking at the walls of Kemet and said, "Here, what this story right here, we're going to put it down and attach it to Jesus. And I think, do you see that being done as far as a direct influence of um, Kemet to, to Christianity? I mean, the word direct is tough. Christianity was formed and shaped first in a Levantine space in the highlands of of the Palestinian lands or, or ancient Israel, Judah, however we want to call it. Cause wow, you want to start a bar fight. What you call that place is also very <laughs> controversial, right? Um, mm -hmm. Exactly. So it starts there with a Jesus who is crucified. This is a Roman um, imperial uh, dispatch method. So he's he's taken out if there's a historical Jesus, and I do think there was, um, by people who saw him as a political threat and and a problem to maintaining their control of of this space and of this Judean space in there as a province as a Roman province. Now, the cult of Jesus once he's martyred then spreads, and it spreads to Egypt right away because it's right there. And, you know, Jesus himself as a, as a child was in Egypt. This is a place where people are going back and forth um, to there. There are no borders of these lands. There's no nation States. There's, there's um, this is all part of Rome. So, so you can go back and forth between these, these places. Um, once the stories start to spread, because Jesus is dead once the cult is ongoing, right? He's not spreading the stories. A bunch of dudes who are walking around spreading his stories, his his gospel message are, are going out there and they're writing things down. They're connecting with religious thought leaders, um, cultural leaders, and things are always going to get parsed through different lenses. And one of those lenses is the Egyptian lens. There are other lenses. <clears throat> There's a a, far, a lens from the farther east. There's a European lens, um, but there's also an Egyptian lens. And Egypt is right there. So as the Jesus cult is moving and forming and shaping and things are being written, and remember all of our Bible, New Testament stories are written after the death of Jesus. Some of them um, 40 years, some of them 60 years, some of them 100 years after the death of Jesus, but they're written after his death. The religion is shaped after his death by people all over the Mediterranean region. And Egypt is then a part of that game of telephone, if you like. And if you're a scholar of early Christianity, Egypt is a treasure trove for you because you have gospels there that don't exist in other parts of the world, like the gospel of Thomas. There's even a gospel of Jesus um, there if, that's in Coptic Egyptian. Um, there's, there's old gospels that are... Um, showing you how the Egyptian cultural trends then translate and become part of the Bible that's made scriptural with the with the night the Council of Nicaea, right? So all of these ideas of Jesus's birth, which is only written about in in one gospel, I do believe it's Luke, I think. Um, I'm not an early Christian uh, Christianity expert, but that one gospel, um, it it's it, yeah and i'm not going to try any gospels because this is not this is not my jam but what is my jam is talking about things like the the idea of a birth of a god that is egyptian that does not involve a woman having anything to do with it except being a vessel and a god who creates himself that is something that i know as an egyptologist from texts that go all the way back to the pyramid texts that the god creates himself and so this idea of a virgin birth, as we call it, a God who implants himself into a, into a body, this is a very Egyptian idea. And 
I do think now I'm going to come back to this very charged word of yours, direct. Um, I do think that Egyptian cultural influence directly influenced that that um, that notion that that Jesus just came into this womb of Mary through a Holy Spirit, um, through a channeled movement of power. So does that does that answer your question? Yes, it does. I, yeah. And I, I'm going to tell you something that's going to be really funny. Where's Where's Onka? Onka, where you at? Because I'm right here. They love you, but you said something that's going to get you a lot of hate mail. Okay, here we you, go. You, <laughs> Jesus is historical. Yeah. In this community, they don't believe that at all. And anybody that says that is hated, and they don't know what they're talking. How about. interesting! Because why can't you have both? Why can't you have a historical Jesus in addition to having a story and mythology of Jesus that's then parsed through a, a certain set of, of cultural streams? I mean, it makes perfect sense to me. That's so interesting. Yeah. They don't, they don't, they don't. It's a part of the package, though, to be. Yeah. To, to, no, go, that's, ahead. go ahead, brother. That's not what's going on. It takes a certain level of prerequisite forces to understand what you just said. People don't just think that way. You know, once you get in certain levels of thinking and reading, you start to see things a little bit differently. So I get what you're saying, but but they don't get that, right? Garfield said all the time, you can have a mythological, you can have the mythology along with the historical person, right? That That's the way it goes. So that, that wouldn't be an issue. Jesus wouldn't have to float on water and have all the loaves of bread and not to be a real person, though. But, but that's understanding history in its true sense. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, the game of telephone is a really useful analogy because the the stories that are spread and how people talk about this this person, you know, it, you're talking about walking on water and loaves and fishes and, and somebody who believes in historical Jesus would be like, that didn't ever really happen. But the eyewitness accounts of the miracle are everything. I mean, that's why the cult is spreading, because people see that power. So it's um yeah, it's complicated stuff. How do religions start? It's not the only place where you could actually track how a religion starts. And this is really interesting is looking at the Latter Day Saints creation of a religion by Joseph Smith <laughs> and using Egyptian texts to to say he's talking directly to God to say that he's creating an Egyptian religion. And trust me, I get hate mail from this quarter as well, because I'm also involved in how the Egyptian texts were used by Joseph Smith, how modern day Egyptologists trained, one of whom is trained at, was trained at UCLA, say that Joseph Smith was translating from the Egyptian into English and that it's what the Egyptian says. And it's not. <laughs> and he knows it's not. But sure. he's using his PhD to claim that it is. And now they have to walk that story back. And it's a whole it's a whole thing. But um I, it, yeah, it's it's interesting. You know, you know, it's funny. I got a, a sidebar. The Joseph Smith thing is so funny that you had these two students who try to not catfish him, but trick him. They put this whole document down, and they knew it was fake, and they try to set Joseph Smith up to say it was special from God, and he had to be cautious, and they kind of called him out because it was fake. They knew it was fake, but he tried to say it was. You know, that's Joseph Smith. Does that, but. In Jamaica, we had our own Joseph Smith situation. It was a oh. guy by the name of Bedward. He's a legend. It was alleged that he went on the roof. He claimed he was a prophet from God hmm. and that he could fly. Yeah. So the story is he really jumped off the roof, him and a parishioner, and they broke their legs. He ended up in an insane asylum. But the story today is he really did fly. Yeah. yeah now, there's yeah, yeah. called Bedwardism, which led to some one sect of the Rastafarianism was influenced by him. So you ah. see, like we have our own Joseph Smith. And there's so you can track the creation of religion, right? And the beginnings of Christianity is just as messy, just as messy. And yeah. it's and it's why Christianity is so very useful in a white supremacist America, because you can take the parts of the New Testament that allow you to enslave and control and exploit women or people or who are othered or whatever. And and Christianity can't be used in that way. Um so Religion is always that way. You don't you don't want something that's clear and and uh, scientifically um, empirically proven. It's not that's not what religion is is used for as a tool of power. Mm -hmm. It's a tool of power 
because it can neither be proved nor disproven. It is <laughs> ideological, and yeah, that's it's why it's powerful. I call it a revolving door. Nobody's going to win the argument. Nobody's. No. no. Let me. We got like five minutes left. Let me ask you this: Do you see a virgin birth with Isis, Heru, and Osiris? Do you <laughs> see that? Yes, and I will tell you why. So your listeners can Google the Temple of Dendera. Mm -hmm. And they can look at the the Osiris laying prone and dead on his mummification bier. Mm -hmm. And you can see him coming back to life. Like a cartoon scene. There's one scene where he's dead. There's another scene where he's starting to come back to life. What does that look like? Well, his penis becomes erect. And it's like, you know, all of a sudden there's this column out up in front of his body. What's the next scene? Well, his hand reaches out to his penis and he starts to recreate himself. These go back to the oldest texts. How does the universe get created by divinity when there is no understanding of divinity and divinity kind of has a body and he has to create himself? He reaches out his hand to his male member and he makes orgasm with it. The texts are very clear. You go to this Dendera temple and it's very clear. Like the Egyptians are, you know, they don't want children to go into this place because right. the God is jacking off. He's jacking himself off into rebirth. <laughs> Once he has recreated himself, mm -hmm. he starts to rise up from his mummification beer. His upper body lifts up. But before that happens, Isis lands on top of his penis and is impregnated by Osiris. And this is very proto-Christian because you have the idea that Osiris is dead, but he's come back to life. But one of the methods of his rebirth is through his son, through his only son, mm -hmm. Horus. And Horus is there put on the earth, right? Uh -huh. And he is the rebir reborn Osiris in a sense. And in a sense, Isis is just there as the vessel. She's just there to receive what Osiris has given her as his reborn self. It is a miracle. I'm not saying there's no sex between Isis and Osiris. There is, and yet it's shown, very Holy Spirit-like, may, may we go there, um, that she's depicted as a bird on right. top of his penis. Oh, right. what is, how is the Holy Spirit so often depicted, but as a bird? And yeah. exactly. She's a kite. She's a hawk. It's a different kind of bird. And yet it's this thing that is, it, it's a it's a way that humans have of depicting movement or non-human bodily form, something that's, that's uh, receiving something, but isn't in a human body. She's not there on top of him as a human goddess. She's there as a bird. And, and then Horus is born from her more human looking body. But that story, that, that has deep roots, um, thousands and thousands of years of deep roots. It is a mystery that the Egyptians base their entire religious system about this idea that rebirth can come from nothing uh, or from one being and from one masculine sexual being. And it works perfectly when you, when you bring this Jesus cult into Egypt. They're like, oh my God, we get it. This is how it worked. And you get new stories of his birth being created through the Egyptian cultural stream. And um, you can have a historical Jesus and a mythological Jesus and make that work. I see no problems with it. Yeah. Well, instead of a, a literal virgin birth, would it be a supernatural birth? Would, it be, would that be a better expression? Yeah, I think a supernatural birth, but also a birth a replicative birth of oneself. Right, so it's right. a birth from one generation to another, but of yourself. So that right. you send yourself down into another generation as your son, but it's you. And right. what do Christians have to deal with? I grew up Roman Catholic. You know, you've got the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're all one God, though. And this is the fun thing about Christianity is they're trying to be monotheistic, <laughs> but they're not. It's really not. And all those Egyptian cultural streams are all in there and it's all polytheistic. And and yeah, so it's God in all of his different forms. He's the movement of the Holy Spirit, which is also very feminine. The Egyptians will tell us, the Coptic texts will, will tell you how feminine that Holy Spirit is. It's the nursemaid. It's the mother figure. 
and then there's the father, and then there's this son who's only there in material form for a short period of time and must be sacrificed, which is also very associated with Osiris's sacrifice. Every year, seasonally, he must he must be killed. Um, so, yeah, it all, it all works very well. The, the Egyptians are like, oh, we got this. Really? This dude was killed by the Romans and he was able to do all these miracles and stuff? Okay, here we go. And d was it malintended? No. Was it nefarious? No. Are they lying about it? No. It's just people who have a certain way of thinking about God and divinity who are taking this story in, embracing it with both hands, and then turning it into something that works for them. Um, I'm going to give the last question to my brother, Uncle, uh, before we tell, go. Tell you uh, what I want. While we was on break, what did you say was quote unquote bull crap? <laughs> what did I say was bullshit? Um, which what what did I say? Oh my God, remind me. The population changing out from ancient Egypt. Oh yeah, yeah. So you know when I'm teaching undergraduates and you okay. you learn about like the Arab occupation, right, or the Arab conquest. We we often call it the Arab conquest of the the seventh and eighth centuries A.D. Mm -hmm. Um, CE. And um, and in our simple minds or in a simple undergraduate mind, you know, they'll look at you and they'll be like, wait, so all the Egyptians left, where did they go? They're all replaced by Arab speakers. I'm like, no, no, no. You've got an overlay of an elite. A new elite is coming in. Historians call it elite replacement. So you might get 10% of the population coming in that now takes over the top of the social pyramid. And then everyone else is then meant to follow their cultural lead. So they all start speaking Arabic because that's how they get the money and the jobs and the influence. They better speak Arabic and they abandon their Egyptian language identity. That does not mean that, you know, millions of people left Egypt. All the Egyptian speakers just left Egypt. That's that kind of understanding of history as a mass of people moving in and a mass of people moving out. That's a simplistic mythological understanding of history that's easy for our human minds to understand. Oh, all these people moved in, all these people moved out. But it's hard for us to understand things like, you know, if, <laughs> here's another example that I really like. If you go to England and you went to England in the 1930s, right? All yeah. of the upper crust Brits were trained in Latin, right? They don't do it as much anymore. Though if you go to Eton, I'm sure you do your Latin, but they're all trained in Latin. What the hell is Latin? It's the language of the conqueror. The, the Romans came in and they conquered this British area. They conquered the Britons. They even took Boudicca's daughters and raped her, raped their daughters in front of her. Boudicca is going around trying to raise her kinsmen up and try to fight against the Romans. She has a good year of, of battles against the Romans, but they will win. And it's a brutal and sad victory. But what do the Britons then do? After this conquest, they associate with their conquerors. They learn the language. They learn their religions. And Christianity is going to come in through the Romans as well. They're going to speak their language. They will not speak the British languages that they used to speak. They will use the writing system of their conqueror. Are they all Romans? Hells no. Did you get a whole bunch of Romans coming into Britain? Yes, but does it replace the population? No. no. You get an overlay of power. And then that power filters down through the, trickles down, if you like, to use a Bush word, trickles down through the community. And then people, if they want to have influence, they learn that that material. They associate with it. They change their identities so much so that you can't see it anymore. Mm. I was I was with my son once, and I talk about this story in The Good Kings, that, that book that I keep mentioning. Mm. My son said, Mom, where did all the Native Americans go? Because I'll talk to him about white supremacy. I'll talk to him about stolen indigenous land. And yeah. and he asked me, I think he was probably six. And yeah. he goes, where did all the Native Americans, where did all the, in we don't use the word Indian, we, where did all the indigenous, he probably said Native Americans, where did they all go? I'm like, they didn't go anywhere. If the ones who weren't killed by, by yeah. all the diseases, exactly, yeah. or the enslavement or all of the other, all of the other issues that that um, white supremacy brought to this place, the manifest destiny brought to this place. The ones who are still here are all still here, but you can't see them. And it's funny, when he asked me, I had a friend there, Luis, who's got the perfect Aztec nose, right? And I said, mm -hmm. they're right there. 
They're right there. <laughs> but he's not speaking the indigenous language right. here. He's speaking right. the language of his conquerors. He speaks right. Spanish and he speaks English. Those right. are the languages of his conquerors. Does he now identify with being indigenous? Not really, because that doesn't serve him right. in this place where identifying with your conquerors gives you power. And when you ask me, you know, was there a historical Jesus? Did did um, all the Africans get replaced? You know, Africa used to be black and now it's not. This is thinking in the ways of our conquerors. Mm. It is thinking in a way that mm -hmm. is patriarchal, all or nothing, conquering mm. rhetoric and thought mm. processes that it can only be one or the other. It is painful for us to think, I now am a... a a, you know, turncoat. I am a betrayer of my people. I'm using a religion that wasn't mine. I'm speaking a language that wasn't mine. I'm using a text that wasn't mine. I have, I have forgotten who I was. We don't want to think that way, but if we do, then we can find where our actual origins and past were. And it's much more complicated, but much more beautiful than this patriarchal all or nothing, millions of people are moving from one place to another kind of bullshit story. <laughs> you, just, you, just, you just made my commercial for this video right there. That, that's the 60 second. That's awesome. That's awesome. You're, 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 hey, God, you're, God, hey, God, Phil. You know, hold on, before you say that, for the first time, if I ever said I fell in love with an Egyptologist, <laughs> it would be Kara Cooney on the front. <laughs> Hey, I'm in love with an Egyptologist with her picture. And I'm going to make a short with this part of the video. You did. I'm like, oh, my. I couldn't have said it any better. I got to shut my mouth and just listen and applaud you because you're a great mind. I always thought you were. But you, you're, you're, oh man. You know, I'm, and it's, it's so one I'm thing. Your, I'm your stalker fan right now. Oh my God, you're so sweet. To follow up on that, when, when I, I did a podcast for, um, another black um, podcast and it's called Socks and Sandals. And he okay. was very upset with my last chapter in The Good Kings. And in the same way, when I said Taharka was imperialist, you went, not Taharka, don't do <laughs> Right? <laughs> because then we're all complicit. All of us, everybody, it doesn't matter. There's no good and there's no light and dark, good and bad. We're all part of this messy human world. We've all been conquerors before. We've all been diminished. We've all gone on the upswing. We've all come down in our past, in our, in our ancestral lineages. We have all of it. And yeah, there's a hell of a lot of white supremacy out there. And yes, it needs to be named and fought, but that doesn't mean that we fight it with their weapons. We have to fight it with other weapons. I told them they was promoting colonialism. They didn't listen to me. They didn't, did they, Garfield? They ain't going to us. They ain't going to good old, my friend, Kyra, my new friend, my new best friend. <laughs> hey, hey Garfield. Hey, Garfield. I don't got to argue with them no more. I'm up 30. I'm going to get out the contest. I'm up 30. I don't want to hurt her ankle at this point. Kyra, let me ask you this. If I may call you Kyra. Yeah, please, please. Kyra. All right. Um, are you willing to come back because I think what I want to do is I want to do something on your books. Yeah. And what you bring to the table as far as that people could purchase and buy. I mean, I'm going to have your books all over the screen while the interview is going on. But I do want to talk about your actual. So what I'm going to do is I need to actually take three weeks to read all three of your books. Yeah, don't tell me. Or not, listen. You can listen to them. It's not more than 400 pages, right? Not more than 400 They're pages. They're each about 400 pages. If you listen to them, it'll go faster. It'll go faster. I think listening, they're each like, I don't know, seven, eight hours, something like that. All right. All right. You know what? But you don't, you don't have to go crazy. Just listen to the chapters you like. Like each one is separated up into different chapters. So if you're not into Ramses the second, don't do that one. Listen to the Akhenaten. You know, read the one that is most interesting to you. And I think... Like for good kings, you should focus on Akhenaten, Ramses, Taharka. If you read those three chapters, you've got what you need. Then you're mm -hmm. okay. Um, so, and and the when women ruled the world is kind of a different feminist discussion. I think okay. good kings is more your jam. So that's the one you'll want to focus on. Yeah. Okay. I like the woman kings though. I, I want. I want to. Be no, good. they're awesome. They're awesome. But it's a you know most of what we've been discussing here is going to fall into that other into that other category, that other book. You know what? We never um touched on, and I know I'm a bit a bit over time, but um the fact that after the Assyrians they were able to get themselves together with the help from the Greeks and so forth um, to push out the Assyrians, right? And um, 
Kind of. They puppet actually, dynasty. the Assyrians brought in a puppet dynasty. The Assyrians were good right. imperialists. They weren't going to stay. Nico. So they, they put in a puppet dynasty of Libyan kings mm -hmm. who right. then ruled over Egypt. So, and then you get a native set of dynasties, the 20, 8th, 29th, and 30th dynasties are Southern Egyptian, like make Egypt great again kind of dynasties. Mm -hmm. And and then, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> and then you get another Persian occupation, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the Persian occupation was, they didn't, was they didn't tough. Really care, they didn't really care about Egypt like that, to like bodyguard it like the Romans, like I'm going to watch this. And that's how they ended up losing to, um, I think, Nectanabal II and all that stuff with the help of the Greeks. But the reason why I brought this up was because of the Babylonians. They were able to get together to actually defeat the Babylonians from actually conquering them. Because that was the only empire that really never really conquered Egypt. All, the, all of them. That, that I mean, they sacked Memphis and Thebes. They did a number on it. And then those 26 dynasty kings had to send back all kinds of gold and riches. So it depends on your... They didn't they, occupy it. They right. didn't occupy it they conquered it but they didn't settle and stay because they had other problems of their own to deal with yeah all right cool all right so ladies and gentlemen this is the great dr kyra cooney and we had a beautiful conversation with my good brother brother Ank. and um hey you're welcome to come back anytime whatever you got going on any projects you want to let me know about you could always email me all right. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. I had so much fun. It was a really fun conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate